Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. If you're wondering who I am and what I'm all about, head on back to episode two, which will tell you my entire story. Otherwise, you probably know me by now. Today, I'm going to be sharing a story of a woman, Susan Lipson, who reached out to me on Twitter, which, by the way, if you reach out to me on Twitter or Facebook and don't get a response, please reach out to me on Instagram or through my email because I don't often check those two social media platforms. But Susan reached out to me about a story that she had written that was in Chicken Soup for the Soul that she wanted to share. So I will be reading that today. And then next Monday, we'll have a poem that Susan wrote that was inspired by my podcast. So how incredibly touched I am that my poem and that my podcast actually inspired someone enough to write something about it. So stay tuned for that next Monday and enjoy Susan's beautiful story of her connection with Connie. Connections by Susan Lipson. I had moved to New York City and decided to find a job in a literary agency by cold calling agents listed in the writer's market, 1988. I found one agency in my new neighborhood. Connie Clausen announced a husky voice on the phone. I immediately felt lucky. The agent listened to three quarters of my self-promotion spiel and then interrupted me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. How did you know about the job? I haven't even placed my ad yet. I laughed. I didn't know about any ad. I'm just cold calling you from the writer's market. So you are looking for someone then? Ha, ah, honey, she said. You better get over here quick. I like the sound of you. How soon can you be here? I like the sound of her too. It still resonates in my mind, that deep Lauren Bacall voice that impatiently sliced through the formalities, always punctuated by a distinctive throaty laugh. That voice alone made me get over there quickly. Living only a couple of blocks away from her, I arrived in about six minutes. Connie laughed as she opened the door, displaying a Lauren Bacall face to match the voice. Now that's what I call fast, she exclaimed, waving me inward. Her shining blue eyes, graced by soft wrinkles, showed decades of mirth and or pain, mirrored her voice as we talked like two new friends learning about each other, rather than like an employer interviewing a job applicant. I found out I had the job when she answered an editor's friend's phone call in my presence. Oh, hi, Diane, honey, listen to this. You'll never believe it. I'm sitting here with this terrific girl who just walked into my office looking for a job. It was like meant to be, and I didn't even have a chance to place my ad yet. Just wait till you meet her. In a very short time, a warm warm friendship developed between Connie and me. She inspired me with her self-taught, brilliant editing skills and her confident assertion that she, without any college degree or fancy credentials, knew more about writing and editing than most people with MFAs. Look, I edit these MFAs now, she laughed. Who could argue with a former book publicist who had climbed the corporate ladder by challenging her superior's marketing decisions, turning herself into a VP of publishing by launching two major bestsellers almost single-handedly. Connie trusted me as an associate and as a friend. She called me the daughter she never had. She gave me manuscripts to edit and rewrite, and within a few months assigned me my own clients as well. She sowed her faith in me by answering my advice-seeking questions with a dismissive wave as she rushed off to appointments, calling over her shoulder, You can handle it, Susan. I know you. But she had time to tell me stories, and I couldn't help but immerse myself in the compelling comical tales. She was a gifted storyteller who, ironically, wrote only one book of her own, though she had at least 10 within her, choosing to spend her life as a passionate midwife to authors rather than the author herself. Driven by her passion, Connie pushed her way through obstacles, using humor as her shield, drama and style as her platform, and shrewd insight as her weapon. When she called me at my home in California years later to tell me about a serious eye problem and ask my eye doctor husband to refer her to a specialist in New York, my heart sank. Her prognosis, I knew, was not a good one. One good eye and all that reading. 
How could she cope with that obstacle? As long as I can read, I'm working, she declared. At least I look better than I see. We laughed together, miles apart, yet still connected by more than phone lines. I know that because of the dream. The dream that made all technological connections seem no more powerful than paper cup telephones connected by strings. On the Thursday before Labor Day weekend in 1997, I was in the middle of other random dreams about mundane things when the screen in my brain faded to black. From the darkness came Connie's distinctive voice. Susan, honey, I need your help. Connie, is that you? Yes, honey, can you please come here? I suddenly found myself as a disembodied observer in her home office. I saw everything in such vivid detail that I have dubbed it hyperrealism. Our rooms we once worked in together were dimly lit. Dusty piles of unread manuscripts covered my old workspace, an ominous silence replaced by usual ringing phones. Around the corner in the living room, meeting room, another stack of tall manuscripts stood on the wooden coffee table. A lipstick-stained coffee cup sat beside them, empty but for a drop. And beside it, a plate still smeared with butter and sprinkled with crumbs from her daily bagel. I could hear her sigh as I viewed the bulletin board crammed with to-do lists and book auction lists, but I couldn't see her. Her voice merely emanated from around the corner in front of the bathroom. Susan, I can't run the agency anymore. I'm dying. I need you to get things in order. Dying? How do you know you're dying? I just know. Now you've got to help me, honey. Clean up all this crap. Make sure everything's handled fairly. Make sure it's all done right. Of course I'll help you. But how do you know? The dream dissolved as though she just issued one of her dismissive waves in reply to my question. I awoke, sweaty and breathless. I nudged my husband awake and recounted my dreams. He mumbled, why don't you call her if you're worried? So I did call, but only reached her answering machine. Hi, Connie, it's Susan. It's Friday morning, and I just wanted to say hi. I, uh, kind of had a weird dream, and, well, I just want to hear your voice and know that you're okay. Call me when you have a chance. She didn't call back. I figured, since Labor Day weekend was starting, that she might have gone down to Florida to visit her sister although the dream haunted me all weekend. I dismissed it as some aberration from my writer's imagination and got back to my regular business after the weekend ended. Three days later, a former author client phoned me to tell me she had just called Connie's office and Connie's son had answered and said his mother had passed away. I shuddered as a cold tingling spread over me. I immediately phoned her son at her office apartment in New York. He had said she had fallen into a coma late Thursday night or early Friday morning at the same time of my dream and had been found on her floor barely alive by an employee on Monday. She died shortly after arriving at the hospital. I blurted, Michael, was she found in front of the bathroom? That was the location of her voice in my dream. Well, yeah, she was. Why do you ask? I shared the dream. Michael was silent for a moment. Then he cleared his throat. I thought you were calling about the will. The will? You know how disorganized my mother always was. Well, the only will she left was the one she made back in 1989, the one that leaves you in charge of overseeing the sale of the agency and the disposition of assets. I saw a flashback suddenly as if I was watching a film. Connie and I discussing her surgery, her surgery plans for a hysterectomy and how my job requirements would expand during her six-week recovery period and possibly beyond if the surgery were to reveal cancer. And how I was now named in her will as the manager of the agency in the event of her death. Clean up all this crap. Make sure everything's handled fairly. Had Connie's soul left her body to call out to me in my sleep? Had I ignored her? No, I had called her and left a phone message. In fact, she might have even heard the machine recording my voice as she lay paralyzed on the floor. 
knowing at least that I had received her communication, I can imagine her relief knowing that her message had been received. What I can't imagine is how she decided to contact me while she hovered between here and there. What an honor, what a gift to have connected in this way. After Connie's passing, I felt compelled to visit a psychic. She shared with me Connie's younger life and her new observations from the spiritual realm, details that I later verified while helping her son set up for the Celebration of Life service in Manhattan. I flew there from San Diego on two different planes, and on each otherwise packed flight, I was amazed to have an empty seat to my right and chills tingling over my torso. In my mind, I told Connie that I knew she was flying with me. On the flight, a song, both lyrics and music, started playing in my head, as my songs usually do, and I scrawled it in a notebook as fast as it played. The song is called Queen Bee because Connie was like a queen bee, with drones always swarming around her stellar presence to gain inspiration and energy. She had a remarkable energy, as I wrote in my story. I asked her mentally whether I should somehow share this song at the service, along with the words I had prepared, those which were actually in the first draft of the story that eventually got published in Chicken Soup. She seemed to tell me to sing it, and my heart raced at the terrifying thought of singing a cappella in front of these bigwigs in publishing, since at that point in my life, I had never sung publicly. I got the distinct feeling she was pushing me, as she always did, with her just-do-it attitude. When I landed in New York, my brother Stuart, who lives there, picked me up from the airport. I was in a daze, reiterating all of the events leading up to the day. An otherworldly presence of Connie on my flight and the song, which my brother thought I should probably read, not sing. He's a guitarist, and singing a cappella in front of strangers sounded like an odd idea to him. Anyway, before he drove me to the city to meet Connie's son at the memorial service, my brother took me to a coffee shop on Long Island. As we approached the coffee counter, the quirky owner asked if we wanted to win a free coffee. He spread out a deck of cards and challenged me to pick the Queen of Hearts for a free coffee. Queen of Hearts? I laughed. To Stuart, I added, well, I just wrote a song about a queen bee, so maybe Connie will help me pick it now. I picked it without hesitation and gasped, but more in joy than in surprise. My brother and the owner were more surprised than I actually was. No way, they both exclaimed, and immediately the woman in back of us in line asked if I was a psychic and whether I would do a reading for them. We were all laughing, while Connie was certainly part of the fun. I had an uncanny feeling that I could hear her distinctive laugh right along with ours. I ended up singing at the memorial service, feeling as if invisible hands were pushing me to that podium, as if I had no choice but to sing. I even sang through tears. I felt Connie's pride in me as soon as I finished, exhaling deeply. Her son hugged me and thanked me for the song that he thought perfectly captured his mom. Connie ended up leaving me in charge of coordinating the talks with the lawyers and the current agency associates who wished to purchase her agency and keep running it. I helped her son through the difficult process, which I felt she wanted me to do. He and I are still friends to this day. I wonder now whether sleep has certain layers of depth, like the comatose state that create a kind of portal for the soul to cross back and forth between the body's world and another plane of existence. Just thinking about these events and similar ones I have experienced since fills me with the utmost confidence that our souls move on after our bodies pass. It also erases any doubts about death and the afterlife in the minds of those to whom I've told this story. In recounting this experience, I realized that Connie's parting gift to me was greater than her visit. 
Her gift was the knowledge that death is a train stop for a soul, an exit to a new station, and the beginning of the next leg of the journey. Not for the one who passes from his or her current existence, but also for the one left behind with this knowledge, who can now appreciate the journey without worrying about departure times or missed connections. I imagine that if tracks can intersect as they did for Connie and me, they must continually offer points of intersection and opportunities for connection throughout our parallel journeys. Thank you so much, Susan, for your beautiful, beautiful story about your connection with Connie. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Curious about what comes next and what it all means? You can subscribe on iTunes. Just go to podcasts and find life, death, and the space between and hit subscribe. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. Ask me any questions you might have. Let me know what else you'd love to hear about or just share your story. I can't wait to hear from you.